Hello and welcome, everybody. I am seeing that you're all connecting to your audio, so welcome, Renata. Welcome back, darling. Um, I want to just encourage you all to, to talk to me. Um, unmute yourself, turn your camera on, say a quick hello. So maybe, Renata, would you like to say a quick hello, unmute yourself, turn your camera on? What about you, Priya? Would you like to unmute yourself and turn your camera on? Welcome. Oh, here we go. Renata's coming in. <laughs> yeah. Hello, beautiful. How are you? Good. My husband's here too, so he's listening. Can I see? Can I see? Is he shy? Mm -hmm. Hello. Present. Hello there. Present. Welcome. Yes. It is awesome. We've got plenty of stuff to discuss. Your wife is a master on the violin. I saw your video. Oh, my goodness. Gracious me. She's so talented and so yes. delightful with her fingers. I Thank think you. you were the standout on the television. You were really standing out with your crew. So uh, thank you. you had a big celebration. Yeah. So, yeah. It was busy this weekend with St. Patrick's Day. Yes. Of course. Darling. Yeah. I had five performances all over town. Darling. Have you got your violin? Spider Man. You got your violin with you. Oh, it's just in the other room. It's a little oh. out of tune. I have I ha I was too lazy to tune it today, but next, next time I I want a I want a little intro. Is that okay? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Welcome aboard. Anybody else that wants to say hello to me? Anybody? Kiosha, Katrina, welcome. Anybody want to say a quick hello? There we go, Katrina. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Tell me a little bit about your fertility story. Uh, let's see. About three years ago, I had this crazy notion from God to have another baby. <laughs> and I thought, me? You want me to have another baby? I have two. Now I only wanted one. Oh, and this is the baby right here talking to me. Okay. I love this. Um, is this your and so is this your little that's girl? the last one I had. He's a boy. His oh, hair is really long. He's beautiful. I love yeah. that. Don't worry. Everybody calls him a girl. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so um I was like, okay. And I told my husband, my husband had he was like, he is always wanting more babies, always. And I'm like, okay, we gotta have another baby. He's like, why should God tell me to have one? Uh -huh. <laughs> he said, I thought you were done. I said, Me too. <laughs> you know what? And I so we just, you know, we just tried. We didn't like put any effort. We just did what we did with the first two. <laughs> um but after like two years, I'm like, okay, this isn't happening. Uh, we need to start looking into some things. And I love research. So I delved into the research and fertility. And I'm like, oh, there's a lot of things that I just have to do for my health in general. Because after having babies, my health declined. You know, I just didn't, I didn't make time for myself and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, worked with my OBGYN and she sent me, she, I mean, cause I was having, um, like bleeding, like right after ovulation. And so my OBGYN does a routine ultrasound at like your annual. And she was like, I'm not liking the way your uterine lining is looking, your individual lining. I want to go do a hysteroscopy, hysteroscopic scopy. She did that. They found a polyp. They okay. removed it. They, they, she, in the, the lining and then I'm like okay we should get pregnant now it didn't happen and because my age she wanted me to see the specialist hi no. <laughs> um, and the specialist did like just general lab the specialist said oh we don't like where your TSH is we're gonna send in thyroid medicine and I'm like I'm like I use pharmacy in my background and I'm like wait, like, do I need to take thyroid medicine? Um, and that's when I started work. I have, I'm actually working with a natural fertility specialist. Um, and she does everything like with the labs and stuff. And I said, do I need to take this medicine? Cause you know how I feel about medicine. <laughs> and she's like, we need more labs to back this up. And we got the labs and it backed it up. She said it couldn't hurt. 
anyway, so I started taking it seriously about six months ago, like understanding like nutrition and taking supplements that labs show that I might need. And um, now more recently, I've delved into my abdominal massage and learning that yeah. technique from a practitioner. Nice. And I've always been intrigued with like any Eastern type of medicine because I'm half Asian. So I'm like, why not? Um, and I came across your uh, book ad on Facebook and I was like, yeah, I need this book. And then I was like, yeah, I'm a community of women that are 40 plus. Love this. Because it's hard to find that, you know, you know, <laughs> so. And, and 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 then um I didn't know if in this community the forty plus era we'd meet more people that are having secondary infertility challenges, you yep. know, yeah. which it, it can be a touchy subject when you're in another TTC forum with women that haven't had any babies and you're talking about we're having a hard time trying to have our fourth, you know, like yeah. so. Absolutely. Well, darling, welcome. Welcome. I'm going to discuss a little bit of that main abdominal massage for our talk today. So thank you for Brent and bringing oh, that up. Awesome. Yeah, it's very fun. Uh, I'm loving it so far. I just <laughs> went for my second massage, but this is the teacher that actually sent me home with herbs and right. does like vaginal steaming and nice. taught me how to self massage. Like, and so when I go back, She's like, I want to see within seven to 10 days because she wants to make sure that she has eyes on me to make sure that I'm doing my self-massage yep. correctly. Absolutely. So, Thank yes. you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Anybody else that wants to just say a, a quick hello before I get started? Priya, Kyosha, anybody? And if not, then I will make a start. So hello and welcome, everybody. Welcome. I want to just tell you that I've got a bit of a, a Q&A at the end, so I want you to stick around and I want you to ask me your questions. So like Katrina did, unmute yourself, show me your face because I love the interaction. I feed off the interaction, I'm high stimulus, and I just feel I'm alone here if I just have to look at the thread and type it out. It's like, you know, so ask me, stick around, ask me your questions directly. Let's turn the camera on, let's have a little chitty chat, and um, so let's get started. So we're going to be talking about pelvic pain and infertility. It's often referred to as chronic pelvic pain or CPP. Anyway, it's a relatively common condition. It affects about one in seven women. So it's really involving that disabling, chronic, persistent pain within the pelvis. And often it can be referred, but it will be, you know, generally associated with other comorbidities like IBS, um, depression, anxiety. We may even have things like pelvic inflammatory disease. So let's look at some of the common causes of pelvic pain. I'm going to try and keep the talk brief because I want to focus on the Q&A. All right, so let's look at the common causes. I'll try and focus it more around infertility and things that you might be experiencing, but I'll also just give you some of the things that are linked to it so you get a, a broader understanding. So some of the common causes, we've got endometriosis, otherwise known as endo. This is where you've got the uterine lining cells and they're, they're found outside of the uterus. And don't you love these <laughs> reminders? With endo, the pelvic tissue can envelop the ovaries or even like squeeze the fallopian tubes. Um, it can also be around the nearby organs, so things like the bowel and the bladder. So during the menstrual cycle or the, anywhere in the period, especially, you know, this tissue responds to hormonal changes. So due to its location, there is like frequently there is pain. Um, so this is, you know, pelvic pain. So when I'm seeing pelvic pain, one of my little red, you know, markers, when I, when I see pelvic pain, I'll often say, let's, let's go and do a laparoscopy. Let's just check out if there's endo because we want to rule that out straight away. And we've got some great strategies for endometriosis in Chinese medicine. So we want to know what stage it is, if it needs to be excised or if there's some ablation. So endometriosis is one of the first 
common gynecological causes of pelvic pain that's affecting your fertility. We've got painful periods, often referred to as dysmenorrhea. So this is where the pain is usually quite fixed in the abdomen. It's usually before and during your period. And, you know, when I'm looking at your periods, you know, I often will, you know, get you to tell me a period diary and I'll see if, you know, what the colour of the blood is. With dysmenorrhea, often the period blood is quite dark. It might be, you know, clotty. And um, if I'm doing tongue diagnosis, Mm -hmm. you'll see the sublingual veins on the dorsal aspect of the tongue, which is the underneath side. On me, my dorsal veins are quite pronounced. I have dysmenorrhea. Interesting. So the body tells a story. So we call this qi and blood stagnation in Chinese medicine. As I mentioned before, we've also got pelvic inflammatory disease. So some types of pelvic infection can lead to pelvic pain. So infection can involve the uterus, it can involve the fallopian tubes, it can involve the ovaries, and it can produce symptoms like pain. Um, it can produce symptoms like abnormal uterine bleeding. It can also cause fever and chills, but it can be un undetectable. So often we need to test for that. And it can create this scar tissue to form around the pelvic organs, which leads to the chronic pelvic pain. Then we've got adhesions. And adhesions can come after infection, like pelvic inflammatory disease. It can come from surgery as a result of endometriosis. So, you know, their, you know, dense scar tissue is often going to cause pain. And, you know, we've even got um, Asherman syndrome, you know, so this is where the scar tissue forms inside the uterus or the cervix. So we want to look at those, those adhesions. Adenomyosis. That's very similar to endometriosis and, and it's characterised by the presence of the uterine lining cells and they're in a location outside of the uterine cavity. So like, it's similar to endo, but it's it, with adeno, I, I'm just going to shorten it, it actually grows into the muscular wall of the uterus. So it causes the uterus to almost double, triple inside and, and it becomes quite large and bulky. It's often referred to a bulky uterus. We've got fibroids. These are benign tumours of the muscular uterine wall and they're the most common tumours of the pelvis in women. So fibroids are often, they're often causing, you know, period pain, dysmenorrhea, chronic pelvic pain. Sometimes there's um, abnormal vaginal bleeding. There might be pain with intercourse. All right, and then you can have, you know, issues, abnormalities with your bowel or your bladder function. So both adenomyosis or adeno and fibroids, they're often referred to as your, as your enlarged and bulky uterus, and they're causing lots of pain here. So um, other things, I'm going to just go through the others quickly. So polycystic ovaries, that's when we, we, or we could have ovarian cysts. These are going to cause pain. Sometimes they rupture, and then they're, very painful. So, you know, and there's a medical emergency when they do erupt and burst. We've got vulvodynia, which is burning, pain or discomfort of the vulva. Now, there's chronic pelvic pain associated with this in the area or around the opening of the vagina. We've got dyspareunia. It's, a, it's, a, it's painful um, intercourse. We've got a displaced uterus as Katrina was telling us about early in her introduction. And then we've got abnormalities of the gastrointestinal system. They're also a common cause of chronic pelvic pain. So this includes things like inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Now, the hallmarks of these bowel disorders include chronic pelvic pain, fatigue, diarrhea, crampy abdominal pain. So, you know, if you're having these issues, this is going to be, you know, a byproduct. It's going to affect your fertility. So, you know, I had actually had a question in one of the groups and they said, do we fix the underlying conditions first? And the answer to that is always, yes, we do. So we need to jump on these other things that are creating pelvic pain because it is going to be affecting your fertility. So other things, irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulitis. Now, the diverticulitis, this is, you know, this can get um, this, the diverticulum, it's a sac-like 
pouch and it may form in the intestinal wall and it gets um, infected. So it, you know, I've had so many patients hospitalised because of the severe abdominal pain, but it, it has that pelvic pain as well. Often there'll be constipation, diarrhoea, nausea and vomiting with diverticulitis. Um, celiac disease. So this disorder is, you know, caused by an allergic reaction to gluten. Now, it's interesting, when I do start working with patients, I often take gluten out because most people have issues with their gut. And anyone that's worked with me, one of the first protocols I work with is a gut healing protocol because we've usually all got gut stuff going on. And I find most of us can live without gluten because it's very inflammatory on the gut. So if you've got any form of dysbiosis, constipation, diarrhea, loose stools, urgency in the morning, bloating, those types of things, you might be, you know, removing gluten might change your life, you know. So give it a go. I say 30 days and you'll know. So it le- when, you, when you're actually celiac, it impairs your um, ability to absorb, you know, anything. So that means you're not making good chi and blood. It's going to affect your lining, all right, and it's going to create more pelvic pain. All right, other things, hernias. There are plenty of other sources of pelvic pain and abnormalities of the, you know, there are abnormalities of not only just um, the, um, the gastrointestinal, we've also got the urinary, the musculoskeletal, and we've got neurological and other systems. So I'll briefly cover a few of those. We've got interstitial cystitis. So this condition may cause the pelvic pain in the bladder and the surrounding tissue, similar to that caused by a UTI. Um, however, there's no infection. So typical symptoms include, you know, if you've got frequent urination or you've got an, um, a real um, urgency to urinate and go to the bathroom. So most women often with interstitial cystitis, they will experience that pelvic pain. We've got recurrent cystitis, kidney stones. They are really debilitating. We've got pelvic floor dysfunction. So this is a um, basically where the poor pelvic floor gets shortened, tightened, and tender. So it's not clear how this um, problem develops, but what I'll often do, and I love working as an integrative doctor. You know, it's not just Chinese medicine. I love to work as a team. So I'll often refer my patients to a physiotherapist to help with this treatment of pelvic floor dysfunction. And often, you know, you've got to look at trauma. There can be trauma, there can be sexual abuse, there can be violence. We've got to take everything into account with infertility. All right, there can be fibromyalgia. So this is a widespread musculoskeletal pain accompanied by, you know, usually there's more fatigue, sleep memory issues and mood changes, but there's often a lot of chronic pelvic pain with this disorder. Piriformis syndrome. So, you know, we've all had sciatica. We know what that is. So the piriformis muscle, it's located deep in the muscle. It gets, it compresses your sciatic nerve and it creates those spasm. And that refers, it's like referred pain, creating that pelvic pain. We'll often get back pain, body pain with piriformis syndrome. And then we've got the emotional sides of things. You know, chronic pain, chronic pelvic pain can be a manifestation of depression or anxiety or any chronic kind of, you know, mood disorder. So we, we and, and, and also if you're, if you're anxious or depressed or down, you know, whatever's going on for you, this can exacerbate the chronic pelvic pain. <laughs> and so we, we need to look at our mood. So I've been actually um, experimenting a lot with the aminos um, with my patients for depression and anxiety because they have that chronic pain and I don't want to put them on benzodiazepines. I don't want them addicted. And what I love about the amino acids is they're not addictive. While you're trying to conceive, they're really powerful. So 5-HTP is one of my, you know, I call it the 5-HTP transformation. You know, so it's just like, I don't know if you've heard of it, but literally it is so good for anxiety, depression. It changes your mood and it's done in 24 hours. When you do a dose of about 50 milligrams, you can just shift, shift. And it's like, if we do look at our neurotransmitters, I could just spend another um, live and another (laughs) Zoom meeting on mood disorders. Maybe I'll do one of those next time. But then we've got the neurological. So we've got the ilio-inguinal nerve entrapment. 
And this, um, we've got pudendal neuralgia. <laughs> Am I saying this correct? I, yes. Your pudendal nerve, it runs from the back of your pelvis, right, into your genital area. So your anus, your vagina, and your penis. All right. So then we've got pelvic congestion syndrome. We've, we've even got peripheral neuropathy. All right. So these are the neurological aspects. You know, that's not really my expertise, but, you know, we have to consider this because there's just so many causes of pelvic pain. Now, I've tried to focus just more on the most common ones related to infertility, but often you'll need a multidisciplinary approach to identify what's needed. And, you know, you often need to work with, a, a, a you know, a plethora of therapists to help you improve your physical and emotional function. So if we're looking at it like, you know, I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine, so my focus is to how, do, if you come to see me, how do I manage your chronic pelvic pain while you're trying to conceive? So, of course, being a doctor of Chinese medicine, I'm always going to recommend Chinese herbal medicine. That's number one, right? It is amazing for balancing qi and blood. It's great for moving blood stagnation out of the area. It's great for reducing inflammation. We've got so many fabulous herbs in Chinese medicine for harmonizing and, and balancing hormones and dealing with that chronic pain, especially things with, you know, things like um, conditions, endometriosis, PCOS. Because of those hormonal imbalances, Chinese medicine, Chinese herbal medicine, it balances the hormones. So it's almost like balance the hormones and then we get to the root cause of the pelvic pain. So, yeah, you know, that's what I love about Chinese medicine. It really finds the root. Is it coming from a hormonal imbalance or is it a structural thing? Do we need to send the, the herbs to the area? Do we need to open up the nerves or the blood flow? Like it's, it's, it's very specialised Chinese herbal medicine when you're working with a specialist. All right, so the beauty of the Chinese herbal medicine, it improves circulation. And remember, if we're improving blood circulation, we're going to move the blockages, we're going to nourish the qi and blood to the area, and then we're just going to reduce your stress. Because part of this, if you've been suffering with pain, especially chronic pelvic pain, for a long time, then you're going to be stressed. It's going to get you down. So we have some um, some constitutional formulas in Chinese medicine, and I'll just mention these. This is all going to sound Chinese to you because they're been pinyin. So dang wei shai ya san, yo gui wan, gui pi tang, ba jin tang, and gui sha di huang wan. Now these are constitutional formulas. I will often find what's your constitutional formula. And then I will look at blood movers. You know, I'll look at some blood moving formulas. We'll always start with the base and then we start to really optimise your formula. So, you know, in Chinese medicine, there's not one formula just for chronic pelvic pain. You know, you are unique. So not everyone gets the same herbs. Sometimes you'll need a constitutional formula. Sometimes you'll need a blood moving formula like Tong Jing Wan, you know, Wen Jing Tang is a really awesome formula I'll use if there is blood stagnation and I, and, and I need to warm up the womb. Or it might be really stuck, stuck blood. So I'll use Shui Fu Jiu Tang. All right. So number one is Chinese herbal medicine. Number two, I love acupuncture. If you haven't tried acupuncture and you're trying to conceive, I highly recommend it. Not only for trying to conceive, but for pain. It's great. It's a great modulator because it works on your neurotransmitters, it works on your perception of pain, and it just promotes that sense of calm and well-being. It's also working on um, uh, the endorphins. These are your, you know, this is your natural endorphins, your encephalins, right, which help modulate pain. So that's what acupuncture does. The moment you put a needle in, inflammation has already gone down. So it reduces inflammation pain, swelling, stiffness, and it balances the hormones, very similar to the Chinese herbal medicine. So the beauty of Chinese medicine is that the herbs work from the inside and they go out and the acupuncture works from the outside and goes in. So they're the yin and yang of each other. So if I was looking at some points, now there's a plethora of points. Don't you love that word, plethora? That means a lot of points. There is like 360 points I could name right now for pelvic pain, but I'm going to give you just a couple, all right? So if you put your hands on your knees where your thumbs land on that quadricep muscle, we call it the vastus medialis. 
It's your inside quad. You'll often see bodybuilders. They're popping when they're on stage, that inside thigh. All right, so spleen 10, where your thumbs land, it regulates blood stagnation in the uterus. It helps with chronic pelvic pain. So it's one of my favourites. Then if you look at your pubis, right, if you find your pubis, write down, feel it. We've got these points, stomach 29, stomach 30. These points are awesome for moving pain and stagnation. Then we've got on the sacrum, that's the fused part of your back. So these are your, you know, bladder 32 to, uh, to bladder 31, 32. Um, you know, if just even if you prod along, you'll feel your sacrum. You can almost go into the sacral foramina. And, you know, these, these points are really nice for opening up any discomfort and pain. Now, I've, I've actually put some little, <laughs> this, this point, I love this point, it's called FUCA, FUCA. It literally is translated as gynecology. Now, this point, I'm going to draw the little dots on my finger. Can you see that? It's on the thumb, two little dots, right, on the thumb. So we find the crease of the thumb, bend the knuckle, and there's those two little points there, FUCA. So I usually use my pen and I point. I point into FUCA and these two points connect to the uterus via the lung channel. We call this Tai Yin and the bladder channel, Tai Yang. So FUCA. It's a really famous little point combination. And I love using little things. So if you've got a pen, clearly, you, you know, you don't want to draw on yourself, but maybe take the biro off and just palpate it. Just press 30 seconds to a minute, 30 seconds to a minute. And I just, I do some little circles on Fuga. All right. It blows people away when they're on my bed and they're having an acupuncture session with me. So let's use the knowledge and share the wisdom. In Chinese medicine, we also have a therapy called moxibustion. So this is um, heat therapy. So moxa, it's mugwort. It's a plant called Artemis vulgaris, all right? Now, it stimulates heat, promotes qi and blood flow and to the body, and it's going to also get that blood flow to the pelvic area. So it's going to reduce inflammation. It's going to give you some relief from the pain. So we often use moxa when you're menstruating, all right? So when you've got your period, we use moxa sticks on the belly or a moxa box and it smokes and it's quite pungent, the smell, all right, and it's great for moving coldness and stagnation and blood stagnation, all right. So, you know, moxa is in. So these are these are some of the tools of Chinese medicine. Now, in addition to that, castor oil packs. I think every live, I mentioned this, I use castor oil packs nearly for everything. We use them in the follicular phase, but when I'm working with pelvic pain, Castor oil packs, you can literally make your own pack. So using wool or some cotton flannel, right, what I normally do is usually make it about three to four layers thick. I'm just folding mine. It's a tissue. But anyway, think that, the, you know, an old rag that you may have, completely soak it in castor oil. I often put it in a jar. This is, this is then, then you can keep it, all right? So you want to wring it out so it's not dripping and it's not going to be dripping on the floor. But you wring it out, wring out your pack, Put it on your skin and then place some plastic. It could be a beeswax wrap if you don't want plastic. Put something over the top of the wrap and then literally put your hot water bottle over the top. Now, the great thing is that you can leave the pack on while you're watching television with your partner or hubby and, you know, leave it for about 20 to 60 minutes. All right, longer is better when you have pain. Then when you finish, put it back in the jar, seal it, leave it in the refrigerator. And guess what? That one pack is going to last you 30 times. Amazing. So how cool is castor oil? We'll often use it in the follicular phase while we're trying to conceive. So from the last day of your period until ovulation, then we stop. So yes, we're going to talk now a little bit. Katrina mentioned her yoni steaming, all right, the vaginal steaming. All right, this is literally... If you look at the yoni, it's Sanskrit for the word female genitalia or the womb or the vagina. Now, it signifies a very sacred place and it symbolizes the divine femity. It's the portal to life. So in terms of pain, when we're yoni steaming, we really use the, the, the warmth of herbs and we can use, we can use the moxa, mugwort, that's often used in the prescription. It's usually a, a group and a, it's custom designed for what your womb needs. Clearly, we might use things like 
um, Chinese Angelica, Dung Wei. I love it because what I love about Dung Wei is that it nourishes the blood. It's going to dispel cold. It's going to relieve cramps and and reduce the pain. So, you know, there's plenty of other things that will go into a yoni steam. And, you know, uh, red leaf, lavender, there's all types of rosemary, the things that you can even use in your kitchen. But ideally you want to have your blend specifically tailored for what you need, all right? So if there's blood stagnation, you may have some interior colon, you may have chi and blood deficiency. So depending on what your differential diagnosis is, you want to modify it. Now, the great thing about a yoni steam, how do you do it? Well, you just boil up some water, add the herbs, let it let it let them steep for about 10 minutes, and then you can sit or squat over the steaming herbs. So you can buy a special yoni steam chair, you can buy a seat that fits in your toilet. You can also just literally wrap a blanket around you, squat over uh, a pot of hers, lean on a medieval or the couch or even your bed, and it's just staying for about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, all right? And so you're infusing. It's permeating the vagina area gently, and it's so relaxing. So often I'll get my patients to drink their Chinese herbs while they're doing their yoni steam. And again, we do this in the follicular phase. So we want to do it from the last day of your period until ovulation, then we stop. Mayan abdominal massage. Again, I love this. I love that people are exploring all these techniques and that's wonderful because we it's often referred to as um, Maya abdominal therapy, our Vigo techniques, all right, or ATMAT. Okay, and it focuses on the abdominal and pelvic regions. So often if your uterus is out of alignment, your sacrum is out of alignment, what this does is it's a beautiful, gentle massage that repositions the uterus and the other reproductive organs to release the physical and the emotional blockages. So, you know, I, I highly recommend them sometimes when you've had, you know, miscarriages and, you know, there's trauma and it's really nourishing, all right? It helps decrease any pelvic pain and dysmenorrhea. So we use it in Chinese medicine as well. I mean, it's I love that other cultures, and you'll find that there's crossover of so many cultures in the work that I do because I just do what works. Epsom salt foot baths. In Chinese medicine, the feet, at the sole of the feet, kidney one, it goes straight into the womb. So, you know, if you're doing an IVF cycle, You'll often hear them say, um, let's have uh, warm socks or put your other boots on. Warm feet equals a warm womb. So Epsom salt contains magnesium sulfate. So you might want to just put in some Epsom salts into a foot soak or submerge yourself up to here and soak for about 15 to 20 minutes in a tepid bath. All right, it helps relieve pain. So if you've got pelvic pain, warm water, the bath itself is going to soothe the body and alleviate the pain. Okay, from a Western medicine perspective, how do they treat it? Well, clearly, I mean, we need to know if you do have endo. So laparoscopic um, treatment, we've got ablation, excision. Western medicine will often um, prescribe um, oral contraceptive pills, IUD, the depot provera to halt the menstrual cycle and therefore hormone production. They might use non-steroidals to inhibit prostaglandin synthesis. So if I'm looking at the diet, how I would work if we got if you've got such chronic pain, severe pain, I'd be looking at the triggers, like I mentioned, remove gluten, let's take out the dairy, let's remove the soy and the sugar for 30 days, and let's just see. So let's just do an elimination diet. And if it works, well, usually we just stay off those things. You can do um, an um, autoimmune protocol, and this is this is a little bit more severe. So, I mean, often, you know, I'd be seeing some um, autoimmune markers. So we don't ever want to stay on an autoimmune protocol for longer than about six weeks um, because it's too restrictive. And who can stand doing an AIP for long? No, nobody can. So I use a short burst, in, get in, get out. We want to just move the pain, move the stress. Then we've got an anti-inflammatory diet, a Mediterranean diet. I might even do the low FODMAP for six to eight weeks, and then we reintroduce foods and see what the triggers might be. In terms of supplements, vitamin D, 
magnesium, you know, it releases the pain. It's great. It works on the blood sugar. It's, you know, it's highly relaxing, works on the heart, calms the stress. Omega-3 fatty acids works on the prostaglandins. It decreases pain, the omega the fatty acids um, decrease inflammation. Uh, probiotics, we want to look at that dysbiosis with the gut. So you could use a probiotic, but you could also use probiotic-rich food, such as sauerkraut and kimchi and kefir and meat, uh, miso-free, uh, soy-free miso, um, what else, beet, uh, beet kvass, all right, ginger. It's very warming, very nourishing. Vitamin E is great for the lining. It's my number one supplement for the lining and for, for chronic pelvic pain. Then we've got the vitamin C, and I'll often prescribe curcumin, your turmeric, you know, if I've got the patients with endo. Lavender oil, lavender essential oil is also great for pain management. Then we've got pathology testing. So, you know, if we, if I'm seeing severe pain and pelvic pain, I'd be looking at doing the Dutch Complete. I actually offer that. And that's, you know, that Dutch Complete is the most comprehensive hormone testing in the world. So uh, that's my number one go-to for hormone testing. Stool testing, if you've got the digestive complications, food sensitivity testing, you know, things that if you're getting bloating, rashes, you know, headaches, you might want to do um, a comprehensive urinalysis to rule out UDI, interstitial cystitis, the kidney stones, all right, because they're, you know, the potential causes of the pelvic pain. We want to do a full blood examination. I want to see what the iron is doing, including the ferritin stores. I want to look at your liver and kidney function tests. Then we'd be looking at a pelvic ultrasound. This is one of the first things I normally recommend when you're trying to conceive a pelvic ultrasound. A laparoscopy, if the pain has been around and has been chronic and it's debilitating, a laparoscopy would be the next measure after the pelvic ultrasound. And then we've got inflammatory markers. So you've got the homocysteine and the CRP levels. We've got autoimmune markers, um, including ANA. We've got a thyroid panel and zinc. So that's your pathology testing. Last thing I wanted to just cover before I jump to the Q&A is by mind-body interventions. So we want to look at slowing down, being here now. What can immerse us into the present moment? When we're in pain, you know, the, I don't know if you know Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. Uh, so looking at those things, reading, journaling, yoga, Pilates, meditation, cognitive behavioural therapy to, to address any psychological aspects of pelvic pain. So these are just some of the things that I hope have helped you today. I hope I've shared some knowledge and information, some causes, some, some beautiful treatment strategies. So I just want to thank you for joining me. I am going to open up the live Q&A. And if anyone would like to have a little chitty chat, pray, speak to me. Hey, Dr. Fiona, I have a question. Um I think first thing, um, I have like, I think I have three questions, but one of them is clotting. Now, if you don't, I'm actually very lucky and blessed. That I don't have any pain for my periods and I joined your webinar just to learn more because um, I like soaking in information. I enjoy your talks. But what I noticed in my last period is clotting. Is that what is that a symptom of? Well, it's a, it's a symptom of, of, of blood stagnation. It's a symptom of, you know, there can be interior cold. It can be just something that is obstructed for whatever reason. It could be just the stress of having to do all those performances. You know, like it can be just <laughs> you were actually performing and practicing and, you know, it was just the stress of that. You're probably just fine. Yeah. If it's a one-off, it's an anomaly and the stress may be just a little higher. It's incredible what stress does to our periods. So the period will always reflect on, like when you get a, a, a period that's like, oh, this one's clotty. Why? What is it? Well, what have I done in the past month? Well, I had five performances. I was on television. I, you know, it was big. You had a big month. Mm -hmm. It can yep. be just something like that. And when we have, you know, carrying the stress, we often will carry it on our shoulders. You know, it's the liver gallbladder channel, right? Gallbladder comes mm -hmm. through here. You're holding mm -hmm. the in on the gallbladder channel. You know, you're practicing more hours than normal. So that impediment of chi flow is going to create that blood stagnation. So I would be looking at what do I love? My favorite 
thing, my number one thing for blood stagnation in the uterus when you get a clotty period is eggplant or aubergine. Eggplant. I love food as medicine. So I would say get your baba ganoush on, get your masaka on, right? Make your eggplant lasagna. It is beautiful for moving blood stagnation. It's mm. simple, turmeric, saffron, shanja. You know, these are all things we just want to move the liver chi a little bit. You know, goji berries even. It might be just you need a little bit more blood tonification, nourishing that lo- um, blood on of the liver and the, you know, kidney yin. All right, so goji berries. I even love, this is my favourite, I was talking about it today, chen pi in Chinese medicine, tangerine peel, mandarin peel. It can be clementines, tangelo, any of those things that you've got. It could be even grapefruit, orange peel, lemon zest. We use the skin of that in Chinese medicine. What we'll often do, don't throw your oranges away, put them on some baking, on a baking tray and some baking um, paper, let them dry in the sun for five days and then put them in an airtight container and use them as your medicine. It's going to move the liver chain. It's going to support you through the month. So you can use it in your soups, in your stews, in your cooking, and there you have it. You're a herbalist already. <laughs> That's great. Um, cool. The other question, other two questions I had came from my, from one came from an OBGYN fertility specialist. And back about three years ago, he says, I think you have endometriosis based on your chart. And now my chart has diff has changed. It yeah. looks actually healthier than before. But my bottom line is, can you detect endo from a menstrual chart? Yeah, you can. You can. You'll often see you you'll you can often start like high. At the start, you know, like, you know, when you're menstruating, often it's meant to start low and then we rise up. We get that biphasic shift. If your chart's starting high and then it drops down quickly, it can often mean that there's that blood stagnation, all right, and that obstruction. Then after you ovulate, it's a slow rise. It's a slow rise. And then it can be like, oh. sore tooth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you can actually see the endo on the chart. But if your charts have improved and, you know, I'm going to be working with you soon, so I will, we will we'll actually reflect on that. So, you know, if you are not a symptomatic, it means endo doesn't have to be symptomatic, yeah? But mm-hmm. if you just, for example, Renata, you started to say, all right, well, my next period is clotty, you know, when was my last pelvic ultrasound and was that clear? All right, let's check, let's do the chart testing. But then, all right, okay, let's do a laparoscopy. Let's have a little look see. You know, it's keyhole. Just coming a look in, nothing to be afraid of. The great thing is when we know, because it's the only real way to know, to go in and get, you know, get a, a small lesion of it and study it under a microscope. It's the only way. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's just, you know, doctors are speculating until we actually yeah. have data. Yeah. How about last one? How about the receptiva test? Have you heard about that? Yes, yes. No, is yeah. how beneficial is that versus laparoscopic? You know what? I'd have to do some research and get back to okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a new, it's new, more, it's new functional testing, and it's not my expertise. But I would let me let me research that and put it in the group. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank Share. you. You're welcome. Anybody else? That wants to have a chitty chat? Who wants to unmute? Anyone want to talk to me before I say goodbye? Katrina, come, please. Come. Okay, so the um, adenomyosis. Yes. Uh, my OBGYN believes that I have that from the ultrasounds, but you know she's like, don't want to go in there and get a sample or whatever. Or she keeps telling me that you'd have to like get the uterus and she's like we don't want to do that so she just thinks that that's what she sees so that was another outside of having that as a possible possible diagnosis and um i had a hsg done in like august last year and they could only confirm one tube was free flowing they just left the other one unconfirmed because they couldn't tell so that's how it led me to the Mayan abdominal 
massage because I just was reading and researching and like that can help if you have blockages or whatnot. Um, but do you have any other suggestions for like a dental myosis? I, well, you're steaming already and I love that. You're, you've got the massage. You could do the, the castor oil packs in the follicular. Oh, yeah. All right. And doing castor oil packs. Okay. okay, great. Yep. And then you could look at doing some Chinese herbal medicine. Try mm-hmm. working with a Chinese herbalist. It's amazing. I have had... Like one of my favorite stories, I've got a beautiful patient. She actually had the worst endometriosis and adenomyosis, but she actually had her um, fallopian tubes removed because they'd strangled them. And she had a So she not only had endo, but she had adeno, but she now now has a little baby. I mean, she had to do the IVF route, but but it's not an obstacle. That's I think the takeaway is that this is no obstacle. Like I work with this all the time. All the time. Yeah. I never really seen it as that. I was just like, anything I can do to make things more optimal, you know, like, okay, yeah, this okay. is something that we need to yeah. work on. <laughs> yeah. So I'd be looking at an estrogen, do- estrogen dominance protocol. So some seed cycling. All right. So this is really good because it's, it's often, you know, it's often an estrogen dominant condition. So I would be going, all right, let's look at removing gluten, dairy, soy, yeah. sugar. All right, I'd be removing those those allergens. So your gut is optimal. So what you are when you're making the chi and blood that it is optimal. I would be looking at yeah you know, yeah um, maca even to balance your hormones. This is a lovely mm-hmm. thing that that you can add. You can add this into your oatmeal, maca, broccoli sprouts, sulfurophane, high in sulfurophane. Okay, diindiolimethane. It's the foods that are rich and dim, so cruciferous vegetables. Got gotcha. you. Yeah, and make sure they're all cooked. Everything really cooked for you. Oh, I got to have it cooked. Yeah. I've had acupuncture done in the past, and that the, the acupuncturist was like, you have to have cooked vegetables. And I was like, that's good because I don't like them not cooked. And <laughs> like Typically, my intuition lets me know what's yeah. good for me, What what's good for me. Of course, yeah. Oh, well, cayenne yeah. pepper. Like I'll often start start my patients on the morning ritual. It's a six ounce glass of water with two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar and a squeeze of lemon or lime. You could add in a pinch of cayenne pepper. What it does is opens up the blood vessels. I love it for blood stagnation and for just opening up things. All right, so it's it's warming and it moves blood stagnation. So you can add a pinch of that. It works on the heart. If you look at cayenne, mm. and the heart in Chinese medicine opens up and dilates the blood vessels. So cayenne, mm. put that into your morning ritual. It sets up the digestive enzymes and it helps the liver, like literally. So it's one mm. of those things that I have on a gut healing protocol. But for you, there's some simple strategies I would implement. Regular acupuncture, 100%. Mm. If you could do that weekly, that would be the okay. add-in. Yeah. Try some acupuncture and some Chinese herbal yeah. medicine because you're doing all the right things. You're so on board. It's just, it's going to be a time thing for you. Yeah, your body, for sure. I mean, um, we're body, coming off of like my first pregnancy was a C-section. So there's just a lot of yeah. down. I was like, something, I was just like, nothing feels right down there anymore. And so when I did go to the, uh, the Mayan abdominal specialist, she taught me how to check and she was like, your uterus is adhered to your pelvic bone, your nice. pelvic bone on this left side. So we got to work to yeah. release it. Absolutely. Uh, right. uh, yeah. Well, I get you in the bath. All right. We want to get you soaking warmth. So Epsom salt. Oh, yeah. Okay. 500 grams. I'm about to go take one of those now. <laughs> I was like, after this, yeah. I'm getting in my Epsom salt bath. Yeah. And also, like in 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 yoga, I get I've, every, all my patients to do Viparita Karani legs up the wall. It's it's the inverted legs. Okay. So all the blood is pooling around that that pelvis, okay. and it's that realignment. You know, when you if you literally put your legs ninety degrees, your right. torso down on the floor. All right. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, it releases the back and the hamstrings, but aids the vagus mm-hmm. blood return back to the heart, helps with the blood flow to that pelvic okay. region. Yeah, yes. so it's going to help with the adeno. I love this. Yeah, okay. even, even some yin yoga, in, in Sukta Bhattakanasana it's called, it's the bound angle pose. Have you heard of this pose? Bound angle, no. Bound angle pose. Yeah, Sukta Bhattakanasana. 
It's the bound angle pose. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite mm -hmm. poses, right? This is great when you've got the, the sacrum out of alignment, okay? Okay, yeah. What you do, like you can use your bed pillows and you can just lay mm -hmm. on or a bolster if you've got a bolster, but doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And what I'll often do is I'll get two stacked up and then one of your cushions from your couch, put it under your head, lay back over the pillows, open up the arms, and then the soles of the feet are touching. So you've got this beautiful rim and it's opening up the pelvis. Oh, cool. It releases the tailbone and it realigns that malpositioning of the sacrum and the uterus. And we do okay. this. Yeah. I'm a yoga instructor, by the way. That and makes it, sense. Okay. It, and it releases the back. It's so nice. So Viparita Karani legs up the wall, Sukta Baddha Ganasana, bound angle pose. You are good to go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so Dr. Fiona, do you offer virtual yoga classes? You know what? <laughs> you are so beautiful. Maybe I should. I love. I would love to get back into teaching. You know, I, I taught for twenty years, and now I just infuse the yoga. It was very sad the last class I taught, but I now just have my own yoga practice. I infuse it in the coaching, but maybe. If you play your violin, I'll do the uh, the. <laughs> I'll do a virtual okay. yoga class. I'll do a virtual pregnancy yoga class, but you'll have to do the violin. violin. Okay, the deal. The deal. The deal. Deal done. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> you guys can pair together and have the violin music playing with the yoga. That would be beautiful, wouldn't it? Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. All right, ladies, um, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for your time. Um, I just want you to know where you can reach me. You know, if you're not in my Facebook group, I've got a Facebook group, Dr. Fiona Tassoni, Fertility Coaching, Helping Women Over 40. I have the School Fertility Tribe. It's for women over 40. I've got Instagram, Dr. Dot Fiona Tassoni. TikTok is Dr. Dot Fiona Tassoni. And then on YouTube, I'm Dr. Fiona Tassoni, Fertility Coach. So, Sweet equinox blessings to all of you and I will see you at the next Zoom meeting.